All right. Um, today's event is sponsored by the Humanities Initiative, um, and we're excited to let everyone know, and perhaps you've heard this at this point, that we are transitioning to a new name and a different kind of setup uh, to the Center for the Humanities starting in the fall. Um, and as that new center develops, um, the mission will continue to focus on things like increasing the visibility of the humanities on campus, and fostering new collaborative research. Um, and I want to thank Dean Krutz in the College of Arts and Sciences for his support um, on these endeavors. And we are really excited about what things are um, in store for next year. If you want to find out more, you can always uh, go to our website, which will pop up, I think, in the chat here in a minute. Um, you can also be added to our um, email list if you would like. You may already be, um, but if you aren't, um, feel free to email us at humanities at okstate.edu. I also want to announce just a couple of things we still have going on this spring. Um, we are now taking applications for our new research group fellowships. They um, uh, will begin in the fall. This is a program that incentivizes a shift from individual and siloed research structures to a cross-disciplinary team model, uh, united under a shared research focus with the goal of envisioning new collaborative research opportunities. And if you want to find out more about that and consider applying for one of those assistantships or fellowships, excuse me, um, you can do that at our website as well. And just to let you know, the due date for those applications is April 4th. We are also co-sponsoring um, an event in April that I want to make sure everybody knows about. It is with OSU's CADRE, which is the Coalition for Advancing Digital Research and Education. On April 13 at 3 p.m. Central, it is virtual. Uh, it is titled Bringing Humanities into Compu Computational Research. It will be a panel with Steph Link, Neil Horton, Robert Redman, and moderated by Hannah Bingham Bruner. And Jace, I think, is sharing the link to register for that as well. So thank you. All right, that is my uh, announcements. So today's event is the third in a series of virtual events that we are running this semester to feature new tenure track faculty in arts and humanities who joined OSU in the last couple of years. And we intend to continue this series next year for uh, new, new colleagues as they um, join us on campus. Each speaker will present a, a quick introduction to their research, um, probably five to seven minutes each. Uh, depending on how long those are, we may or may not have a lot of time at the end for um, Q&A, but we definitely want to encourage you to uh, follow up with speakers directly if you have questions or want to connect with them about possible shared interests or collaborations. Um, one of our goals with these events is to foster that kind of connection. And so with that, um, we're going to start with our first speaker, who is Matthew Salisis in English. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I teach creative writing, fiction in particular. Um, I'm the author of several books. I happen to have someone. So these are the last two. One is a novel, it's called Disappear Obligators Appear. It's a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award, which is the largest peer-reviewed prize in America and in fiction and, and is, a, is long listed for the uh, Dublin Literary Award, which is I think the largest worldwide English prize. Um, and the other is a craft book, which is the first book on writing and teaching fiction by a writer of color um, in the US. And uh, I have two books coming out in the next two years, a novel uh, in January. And it's called The Sense of Wonder. It's about a basketball player and a, an Asian American basketball player and a woman trying to bring K-drama from Korea to America. And a collection of essays um, that are kind of just collected essays that I've written in the past. Our next speaker, oh, let me get my list up here. Our next speaker is uh, Meta Flint in history. Hello, I'm Meta. I'm new to the history department. I am a public historian. 
So my work focuses on helping communities answer the questions they have about their own histories and on building shared authority with those community members. So rather than being a singular expert in a particular field of history, I'm interested in learning from communities and helping them tell their stories more as a facilitator. In that capacity, I've worked in a lot of subfields of public history, many of which I imagine you all have encountered in your personal lives or in academia, including museum exhibits, um, oral history, historic preservation, so the preservation of buildings or landscapes, as well as litigation support. And the, that final field, litigation, is the primary area where I have worked in the past in the private sector and that I continue to work in now um, as a consultant. <clears throat> My work in litigation bridges the divide between business, law, science, and the humanities. So as an environmental historian or a person who specializes in the history of how humans interact with the non-human world, I've been able to provide insight and research for litigation related to Superfund cleanup, um, indigenous treaty rights for land and water use, and various other environmental cases of all shapes and forms. Um, here at OSU, I've been fortunate so far to teach the US History Survey course, and also to teach an introduction to public history class, which I will be teaching again in the fall. Um, it's been great to have a lot of non-history majors take those classes and so that we can all learn from them and the skills that they bring to the research field as well. I'm currently teaching, actually co-teaching a class which Jace is enrolled in um, called Historic Preservation and I'm teaching that with Dr. Laura Arata. That class is all about um, helping students help communities preserve historic landscapes, building structures and objects within and outside the United States. And for that class, we've been doing a lot of collaborative team-based projects around the state of Oklahoma, in Tallahassee, a major county, Stillwater, Guthrie, and Pawnee. And I've enjoyed learning from the students and community members about the state's history. I will be proposing a course um, that will blend some of my areas of research and expertise on the business of public history, which I think will appeal to students who are interested in the humanities and learning more about um, making money, I suppose, outside of um, the world of school and learning and putting the humanities to work in the world, both in the public and the private sector. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. I do think we're going to have some time um, today for questions. So keep, keep those in mind, everybody. Our next speaker is uh, Merle Eisenberg in history as well. Thanks so much. And I have a short thing that I'll share just so that everyone can look at nice photos. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, OK, getting a thumbs up. Uh, so I'm Merle Eisenberg. Uh, like Meta, I'm new to the history department. Uh, I've worked on a bunch of things and I'll talk about them shortly. Uh, I guess to broadly categorize myself, I'm an ancient medieval historian, but I also work on disease and the environment and a few other things that I won't talk about uh, today. Uh, so my work uh, kind of temporally uh, falls generally into a time period that we call the late Roman Empire or late antiquity or the early Middle Ages. Uh, you know, to give you some dates, uh, basically 300 to 1000 CE, um, you know, a little bit on the other side. And there's kind of two themes to my interest. One type of work is interested in what happens during the fall of the Roman Empire, um, right? Not just whether it's good or bad, uh, but how humans experience it and how we still think about it to this day, like this 19th century image uh, portrays. Um, so I'm interested in all types of things and kind of that first bucket of things, uh, for example, uh, you know, how the church, for example, in the Western Europe became one of the largest landlords in the period, right, so how they work with states uh, to make sure that they got to keep their land and continue to pay taxes, which obviously made the states really happy, uh, because they get a landlord who doesn't die and you don't have to deal with heirs, you just get an institution that keeps paying taxes basically forever. 
Um, so that's one bucket of work. And the other type of stuff I'm interested in is uh, ancient and medieval pandemics, uh, which I'll go into kind of a little bit more detail now. Uh, what I've worked on in particular, uh, and this is a graphic from an article that, that came out a couple of years ago now, uh, is what's called the Justinianic plague. And I'll give you the dates kind of on the screen here. Uh, it's a major outbreak of the plague, in, you know, quotes, uh, Yersinia pestis, there's three of them. Uh, there's the Justinianic plague, there's the Black Death, which is what probably many of you are familiar with. Uh, and then there's the third plague pandemic, which happens at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and this is often the first plague pandemic is seen as a dramatic event that kind of destroys the ancient world and kind of this one size explanation for the end of empires. Um, but like my other kind of work, I'm interested in kind of uh, human experiences during a pandemic, right? People don't experience the pandemic the same way. It doesn't lead to the end of the world, uh, but local and regional ways in which people think about their world are, are really key to this. And that the changes are not based on the pathogen or the disease that's killing people, although that's obviously what is physically doing the work, but on human reactions and responses. Um, and this work is highly interdisciplinary and collaborative. So I've worked with colleagues in a whole bunch of fields, uh, natural sciences, humanities, social sciences, with all types of evidence, uh, pollen samples, so you dig pollen cores into stuff, for example, archaeology, uh, coins, papyri, kind of everything and anything I can get my hands on, including uh, ancient DNA as well. Um, during COVID and teaching about pandemics during COVID as well has led me to teach and research more broadly about pandemics in history, and here's just three other ones I've thrown up on the screen. So thinking about and teaching students about what ideas and discourses are the same, what's different, what's changed. Um, I've read a lot of literature before COVID and after, and that certainly changed my viewpoint as well. Um, and so how different groups and people react and how they don't um, is kind of what I've become more interested in in terms of a long durée. Uh, I've also got interested a lot in not just a pandemic or a disease and what it does, but why we think it does what we think it does. So kind of like the assumptions that we all learn uh, in school or as kids or wherever you might've learned it. Um, so when it comes to, for example, ancient pandemics, uh, why we think that they're so much worse when it comes to them than, than anything else. Yes, there's obviously no modern medicine and all that type of stuff, but we do have images that immediately come to mind like this one on the left, you can see here, it's from a video game. Uh, it's one of my favorite images to use, but you can obviously see that rats come up in kind of piles of dead bodies and that kind of stuff. And much of these ideas uh, about pre-modern pandemics and ones in the past are kind of, again, as I said, accepting the biology of a disease of a pandemic as preeminent rather than human reactions. Um, and they're all bound up in ideas that kind of pandemics kind of level the playing field. They equalize this, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, and the other way this has kind of gotten my interest, I've been very interested in, in movies uh, and the important role that movies as a both a, a changing uh, public reactions to disease and also um, being a feature built in as, as changing because of public reactions. Obviously, it's kind of a, a dual process, uh, have shifted over time as well. So movies like Panic in the Streets versus Contagion, uh, when you put those next to each other, are very obvious. So it's a lot of fun to both teach with and to think with. And the last thing I'll say uh, is that I started this work before COVID, uh, but it's obviously become more public facing. Um, you know, so early on, there was an idea uh, that a pandemic would level inequalities. Uh, you can see here from the Salon article from, I think, May of 2020, uh, and making the case that that's not actually the case, and you have to take each disease and pandemic in its historical context, um, and that causes more harm than good. And the other thing I'll say is, is through a podcast that I've been running since March of 2020 called The Infectious Historians, you can check us out, um, and we've had all types of guests on who work on disease, pandemics, medicine from the ancient world to COVID and across the globe. So you can see here we had my uh, colleague Rebecca Kaplan on, uh, Kaplan on uh, in December, uh, which was great. So you can listen to that. And uh, please do also a few other people that you know uh, we should have on do drop me a line. So that's my thing. And I will stop sharing now. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is um, Carolina Sitya Nin from the Languages and Literatures Department. Hi everyone, and thanks to the Humanities Initiative for inviting. Uh, it's great to hear about the interesting work all of you are doing here at OSU. 
Uh, my name is Carolina Sijanin, and I'm originally from Argentina. And I joined the language and literature department last year. I'm an assistant professor of Spanish language and literature. Uh, in terms of teaching, I have taught some literature courses. The last one, an advanced course on the Latin noir, uh, highlighting the social crisis in Latin America as the root of the theme of corruption, moral disengagement, gender trauma, and dictatorship in Latin American detective novels. Uh, and I have also taught language courses in both Spanish and French. Uh, in terms of research, uh, I am mainly concerned with the study uh, of failures in national and individual identity and the solutions to identity that emerge in literature as an expression uh, of society. I also work on the obstacles to critical and academic recognition of uh, female Latin American authors. <clears throat> and in <clears throat> this last area, I was just getting ready to finalize and submit a paper on female Argentinian author, Eve Uar, uh, that shows how academic criticism, including the more academically hegemonic sources and also strangely the most progressive ones, neglect female realist authors like Eve Uar. Uh, but <clears throat> probably my main line of work these days uh, the book project that I'm working to complete, uh, it deals with the uh, failed national identities. And in this case, uh, the failed Argentinian identity. Uh, in the book, I ask, how does literature solve failures in national identity? Uh, or more specifically, how does literature as an emergence of the social uh, dynamize national identities when the crisis strikes? Um, note that uh, the question is directed at very young nations uh, like Argentina or like the US. There is some uh, work in sociology dealing with a similar question of whole nations, uh, the Germans, the Irish, the Jewish, showing the return to the old themes in uh, core national identity in times of identity crisis. Uh, but what about uh, nations like uh, Argentina? Um, uh, is recent in origin and composed of a broad blend of varied immigrant and uh, native populations. So what I do is I explore this question with a broad analysis of late 20 and 21st century uh, works and develop the idea of provisional identities, a sort of uh, identity experimentation in literature as the emergent feature of literary work that engaged with a national identity failure. Uh, I specifically find how in the case of Argentinian literature, the tradition theme of identity that were uh, established in the work of the 19th century are replaced by mutations uh, that what they do is they multiply the idea of what being Argentinian may be. Uh, an important category of recent literary work, I find solutions that uh, enrich the Argentinians with some characteristics of the indigenous people of Argentina to dynamize an identity that is otherwise mainly European. Um, I also find experimentations of identity using uh, populist figures like uh, Evita Perón, uh, the wife of uh, Perón, the president, to promote uh, non-binary and no classes articulation of uh, national identity. Um, and in the chapter I'm editing now, uh, I found uh, a body of work that I consolidate under the name Admigration Fictions, uh, in which typical everyday Argentinians uh, that are frustrated with their neighbors and government in typical Argentinian towns, they move into neighborhoods of recent immigrant groups and they adopt aspects of their culture. Uh, so it could be a Chinese neighborhood or um, other neighborhoods from people from uh, neighbor countries like Bolivia or Peru. And this helps Argentinians, they help them figure out 
who they really want to be. So this is uh, all I have to say about me. So I'm, I'm eager to hear more about the rest of the group. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Andre Xiong. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I am an assistant professor of voice with the Greenwood School of Music. I am a baritone uh, and um, was hired under an artist scholar sort of position. And I have a some materials as well, though they are very crude. So don't <laughs> judge me too much. So um, I, I took a picture with a beanie, and so I figured I'd throw that in there. But uh, basically, these are two performances I had the last uh, two years during the pandemic, um, both of them dealing with different COVID-19 sort of situations. I sang Escamillo in Carmen, uh, Bizet's famous French opera, this past fall. And the, the spring before the spring was in Dayton, Ohio, as Mazzetto and Don Giovanni. And if you look at these little lines down here, you can actually see um, how we divided uh, the spacing so that everyone could have at least eight to 10 feet of space between each other. This is my wife, so that's why it was okay. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, uh, yeah. So um, I just wrote these things out. My, my big uh, activities basically come into these sort of four, groupings of things I like to do. Uh, as an artist scholar um, and as a teacher of performance majors, uh, music majors, and um, even some theater majors, I think that performing is incredibly important. So uh, this this upcoming Sunday, actually, uh, I am a soloist uh, with the Canterbury Voices and the Oklahoma City Philharmonic uh, it, with their concert series down there on Sunday. Um, singing with the OSU Masterworks concert in April, and then I have two opera roles coming up in the next year. Uh, one is Silvio and Pagliacci, and then Yamadori and the commissioner in uh, Madame Butterfly of New Orleans Opera. So um, keeping very active in terms of regional performing is something that's really important for our students that practically need to be able to be on stage and, and be heard and act and do all the fun stuff. Um, outside of performing, I have a really great interest in vocology. This is a somewhat newish term coined in the last about 40 years um, by a, a man named Dr. Ingo Tietze. Vocology basically covers all, uh, is the study of phonation. So phonation being anything that comes from a vocal fold, vocal tract situation. So this includes animals, this includes changing voices, this includes aging voices, basically any form of voice use. Um, I'm a member of the Pan American Vocology Association, and they are currently working on a sort of um, accreditation certification system for a re recognized vocologist, and I'm midway through that process to sort of continue my study in that realm. Uh, I have a few speech language pathologists that I work with as a consultant for singing voice um, in sort of high level voice use, uh, guest lecturing on all sorts of resonance and fun things. <laughs> and, uh, and then one last thing I really enjoy is, uh, despite the fact that I am primarily an opera singer, I teach a lot of musical theater, uh, pop, rock, uh, jazz, contemporary, gospel, praise, worship songs. I, have a, I had a metal singer at one point. Um, and so uh, one of the big things that I think is really important in this sort of changing age is that, uh, at least in the music world, that we start looking at music more holistically and and less sort of in a hierarchical situation and provide uh, resources for everyone to sort of learn how to sing. Um, a few other projects are coming up. I have a recording project uh, to record a one act opera, Covered Love, with one of my colleagues down at Southeastern Louisiana University and as well as, well as some cabaret duets written by the composer, the English composer, Madeline Dring. And then uh, one of my big passions is new music, so the propagation of just new interesting songs. And I am working with three composers right now to put together three song cycles to record later in this year, um, sort of taking on a diverse sort of scope of um, interests. One actually incorporates a saxophone, a piano and a voice, 
go using um, sort of more mythological superhero texts. <laughs> One is uh, by a Vietnamese American composer in New Orleans who is um, taking the poetry of uh, another Vietnamese uh, person, Ocean Vuong, and sort of setting his songs in a certain way. Um, and then the last one is a connection I made this last year with the composer in Atlanta, Georgia, Tamika Howard Stairs, um, who is going to write sort of, what did we call it? I think we called it uh, art song R&B. Um, so music for uh, some some poems I found about my home country of Singapore, well, my parents' home country of Singapore. So one of those big things is sort of just making sure that new music is being propagated. Uh, and then lastly, I think it's really important, especially in the arts and humanities, to continue progressing society and continue to talk about the things and the issues that have always pervaded through our own experiences. And so uh, this summer I'm presenting a poster on inclusivity in the voice studio uh, at the National Association of Teachers of Singing uh, National Conference in Chicago. And uh, one of my colleagues from the University of Minnesota is helping with that. And we are going to see about continuing this work to provide best practices, resources, templates for other private and more collegial studios so that everyone has resources that they can turn to uh, so they're not just shooting in the dark. And um, f furthering from that is sort of the idea and perhaps looking into more articles and um, situations where we can use DEI initiatives and DEI concepts as growth catalysts within these sort of older fields to provide more access for people and to allow everyone to, well, you know, to disseminate the idea that there is a hierarchy in music and that classical music is better than other styles of music that all music is just music and it's um and it should it should intermingle and mix um and then i have a website i don't like showing videos of myself but there are videos of me singing on here if anyone's interested um but yeah it's just my name and baritone um but yeah that's all i have thank you thank you so much all right, and our, our last speaker today um, is Devon Hunt from Theater. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is certainly a, a tough group to close out, but I will certainly do my best. Uh, so I am in the Department of Theater. Um, I teach primarily musical theater performance courses. Um, I also teach TAP. and. Uh, my my background, I kind of got into musical theater. Uh, I was a musician first, and that was how I got into musical theater. So um, I'm also a pianist. Um, and the work I do here, uh, aside from teaching performance courses, musical theater acting, uh, musical theater scene study, and auditioning for musical theater, uh, I also direct the musicals we do here every year. And the fun thing about theater is that you know our research can be either writing and publication or the creative work of putting up shows um so my research if i choose you know i can get on stage and do a show and that's research or i can music director direct a show and that's part of my research and outside of the university setting that's primarily what i do um, i've done some publications uh, i contributed to a book that just got published by Rutledge called 50 Key, uh, uh, 50 Key Musicals, 50 Key Stage Musicals. Um, I wrote a chapter for that book on In the Heights and the kind of breakthrough positive representation of the Latino community um, in musical theater. Uh, I also contributed to uh, the textbook Acting in Musical Theater, which is kind of the gold standard of, it's the one major musical theater textbook out there. And I contributed with some online digital teacher resources. Um, so I've managed to work some academic writing into my career, um, largely because COVID really hit the theater industry hard and took away a lot of our performance opportunities. Um, and I was fortunate in coming out of grad school that I was able to make some connections um, and be presented with some opportunities to, uh, to write and contribute to the literature. Uh, so 
Uh, primarily, I am a director and a music director. Um, in my professional work, um, I most of my professional base is in the San Diego area, which is where I'm originally from. Um, and so I've worked on uh, productions of A Chorus Line, uh, production of Beauty and the Beast at Moonlight Amp Theater out in the San Diego area. Uh, that was last summer. This summer, I'm looking at working on a production of Cinderella. I'll be the assistant music director. Um, and then a production of Something Rotten um, as the assistant director. And already looking forward to uh, next summer, I've been in conversations with a pre-professional program called the College Light Opera Company in Cape Cod um, to potentially direct a show on their season as well. Uh, I, in addition to some of the academic writing I've done and some of the performance work that I do, uh, I also have a couple of other research interests, which you know, it's kind of a matter of juggling which which project in which which area, you know, I'm able to explore at any given time. But uh, I wrote my graduate thesis on uh, the the training that secondary educators receive, uh, secondary theater educators or musical theater educators receive, um, and really just the the deficiency of preparation. Um, a lot of teachers. It's an English teacher who has a passion for musical theater or a music teacher who has a passion for musical theater, um, often coming from tangentially related fields, but without any real training in the just the complexity of what it takes to organize and produce a musical theater production. Uh, so I, my thesis was kind of a, a survey on the data available on the kind of training that teachers receive and the kind of uh, preparation they feel they have and the, the preparedness they feel they have to successfully put up a musical theater production, um, looking at the graduate programs that are currently available uh, for interested parties to pursue education in musical theater education. And then I proposed a, a kind of prototype graduate certificate program which lives kind of between it's it's not a full master's program, um, but it is, you know, post baccalaureate um, designed, uh, you know, as I was in California kind of designed to fulfill the credit requirements for a secondary teacher to get uh, an additional teaching certification. Um, that's something that I would be interested to continue exploring down the road. Um, I think that could be a really interesting potential collaboration with um, with the School of Education. Uh, to get more localized data to Oklahoma. Uh, the study I primarily referenced in my thesis was from uh, Arizona public schools. And so it'd be interesting to see what uh, Oklahoma public school teachers, uh, what their experience and their preparation has been those teachers who put up musical theater productions. Um, I'm also interested in new work. Uh, I have the opportunity in graduate school to be part of a new musicals workshop program where over the two years of our education we started with a you know brand new musical we brought in a couple writers who had a script um, and we workshopped the, sh the the musical over the two years uh, had COVID not shut us down we would have world premiered the show um, at San Diego State University in the spring of 2020 um, but we did a couple of workshops uh, we were able to put together a cast recording as kind of a last ditch thing, you know, right as we heard that as you know, we saw the writing on the wall and things were starting to shut down um, before our rehearsals got canceled and the university closed uh, for in person classes. So I uh, kind of got, you know, hands in a number of different pots and a number of different things, uh, just because there's so many different facets of musical theater that interest me um, as a performer, um, as an educator, as a scholar as well. Um, so you know, looking forward in my career, I'm looking to continue kind of doing everything as as time afford is, you know, continuing to direct and music direct, um, also continuing to uh, explore how to strengthen the education for secondary educators who are really the lifeblood and the pipeline for uh, college programs in training and preparing students, uh, high school students to enter the university theater world and then enter their careers in theater. So uh, that's a little bit of all of the things I'm involved with in a nutshell.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, um, I would love to take the time that we have left to open it up for questions for our speakers. So if you um, have a question for anyone in particular, or you want to make an observation, um, you may do that either by unmuting yourself or you can pop things in the chat as well. I really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, everyone's work sounds really fascinating. I've got a question for Matt. Um, it, how did you develop an interest in like infectious disease and pandemics? Because that's, um, I've, you know, I have a number of family in medical professions. And so it's like, I can definitely see the fascination. I also can see how some people might be like, that's kind of morbid. Um, so where did that first interest come from where you said, I want to look at trends in infectious disease and pandemics? I think that was probably for me. Oh, sorry, Merle. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> why I wrote down Matt. I'm no, 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 it's fine. I, 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 I anyways, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, so this is a long story, but I'll give you the short version. Uh, one of my one of my teachers uh, in grad school did environmental history. Um, and so that's where I learned it. Although when I took the course with him, I told him explicitly, this seems dumb and I want nothing to do with it. Um, which he only reminded me of when he introduced me much later on for a talk. So I felt fairly guilty at that point. But um, uh, basically it, it came from, a, as things do, at least for me, a dissatisfaction with kind of grand narratives of historical change, right? That, you know, we kind of look on pre-modern people and I'm, you know, that's what I work on primarily as basically kind of just sitting there and taking it, for lack of a better term, right? That the disease just washes across you and you all die because you don't know any better. Um, and, and so that's kind of breaking down that narrative and really putting the stories that people tell from the time in which we have far fewer than, you know, say COVID, um, obviously is, is what's become, was what really drove the interest to begin with. Um, and I have to say, I, I did this, you know, a couple of years before COVID, so I never thought that this would be, something that that would be kind of the forefront of my work. Um, but it certainly gets both more depressing, um, but also some points of, you know, hope and, and you know, uh, looking toward the future when you can kind of trace out patterns and see how people reacted in the past. Um, that, you know, not everything is, is hopeless, but that you have to kind of break down what's happening. But yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. And Sounds like your show would have been great, just struck at the, you know, two months earlier, one of those things. Um, I guess maybe if I can ask a question, because we can just go to the front. I'll ask to Matt, since he was prepared last time. Do you have particular, since you're a teacher of writing, I mean, I, I just looking at the amount of stuff you've been able to write in kind of different fields. I'm just kind of curious how you keep both fiction and kind of teaching about fiction and just kind of keep writing in both areas simultaneously. I mean, that would some ways when I try to change projects, my brain kind of breaks down for a couple of months before I'm able to move. So I'd love to know kind of how you do it. Yeah, thanks for asking me. Um, I, I guess I think of it all as kind of like one thing, right? So when I'm teaching, I'm just talking about the stuff that I am doing as a reader and writer and then applying that to my own work, um, you know, trying to help my students through the same kinds of problems. So it, doesn't seem like that much of a departure. Um, some of the essays that I write are, are like less about fiction <laughs> um, and those maybe are more <laughs> of a departure, um, but they're usually like from research I'm doing <laughs> on the fiction, right? So like I just gave a talk on eco-fiction and um, because I was trying to write <laughs> eco-fiction, I had, had done all this research. Um, and it was able, I was able to use that also for nonfiction. Are there questions for our speakers? I have a question for Meta, um, which is just, um, I was interested in whether you could tell us a little bit more about um, some of the uh, ideas that you have for doing public history now that you're here in Oklahoma, what are some of the projects? I know you touched a little bit on um, some of the things you've been doing in your current course, um, but I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit on that for us. Yes, well, I was actually just in a meeting with Karen and Sarah talking about oral history. <laughs> 
and um, expanding the internship opportunities for students in oral history in our public history program with my colleague, Dr. Arata. So my vision would be to work with students as much as possible. So my own research ideally will always be attached to something that a student is doing within the field of public history so that we can both learn from each other. And it's a very collaborative field. So it's to me essential to always be working in a team setting whenever possible to kind of create the best possible product that we can create by thinking together. Um, I would like to expand on some of the projects that we've started with this class. So we've done, we're working on, and the students are working on uh, nominations for the National Register, just sort of an inventory of key historic properties in the United States. Um, we're also working with communities whose histories are hidden or lost or concealed from mainstream memory. And I hope to be able to leverage some of the resources we have here at OSU to assist them in amplifying um, those narratives. I am not new to Oklahoma, I suppose. I'm an OU grad, <laughs> and I also graduated from the University of Tulsa. So I also would like to bridge more relationships between the history departments and the different cultural resources like the Gilcrease Museum that are beyond Stillwater and OSU so that again, we can create more opportunities for enhancing learning for our students and kind of not limiting ourselves to these silos, as you said, within our own humanities world here at the university. Thanks. Other questions that folks may have for our speakers? I guess I have um, one other question. Oh yes, here, uh, Matthew has a question for Carolina. Yeah, it was a it was a class that I taught during the, the fall, um, and we study um, Argentina, uh, Cuba, and Mexico, and uh, we started talking about the detective uh, stories, the origin, how um, they start to be in a close uh, box, you know, and and then the the hard boil in the uh, United States in 1920, 1930, how it evolved. And, and then the, we went to the neopolicial, um, uh, that is a term by Paco Ignacio Taibo uh, from Mexico. Um, so the evolution of the um, detective story and how Latin America, many countries in Latin America use the detective story to to tell uh, their stories yeah about corruptions and uh, um, so we could see the different countries cuba mexico and argentina and talk about um, recent events um, and uh, uh, also the the city in these uh, type of uh, fictions becomes the um, like a uh, a character, yeah, it's uh, in itself, um, and uh, it's a good opportunity to talk about current events and uh, about the different countries and to compare. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. Thank you. Um, I was just going to throw out this question to all of our speakers, which is, um, I think you could kind of phrase it a couple of different ways, but. Um, are there things that you are looking for on campus as new members of our campus community that the um, Center for the Humanities can um, contribute to or provide or facilitate? Um, or if you have questions about the kinds of things that um, we might be planning in the future, but I would love to know if there are um, ways that you can envision um, the Humanities Center facilitating um, the kind of work that you're doing, or if there's um, specific aspects of your work that could fold into um, some of the, the things that we might be doing. Um, so, you know, any, anyone can kind of tackle that if, if, you're, if you're up for it. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, does the uh, Humanities Initiative have any kind of like grant availability or funding for humanities research that we're doing? 
we have a new program that um, I did mention really briefly at the beginning of our um, meeting, but I'm happy to talk a little bit more about, um, which has to do with uh, facilitating specifically collaborative research. So we have a new program that is going to be starting this fall. Jace just put the link up. Um, and we are inviting um, applications for nine fellowships. They are um, $3,000 a piece. And what we are hoping to accomplish is that with those uh, awards, we will have three groups of three people who um, essentially the kind of expectation of receiving the fellowship is that you would participate in a collaborative um, research um, brainstorming uh, session over a course of an academic year with the two other people in your group. And the goal being that by the end of the year, we hope that all three of those groups have uh, developed some kind of research plan that they are going to embark upon together. So we're not expecting the research to be completed by the first year, but that you would use that year to kind of um, bring your three perspectives and three bodies of, of knowledge and skills to work together on some kind of new research that wouldn't have been possible on your own. So, um, you know, almost kind of matchmaking, if you will. We're, we're, we're bunching people together and then saying, see what you can come up with over the course of this year. Um, so that is brand new. And we are unsure what exactly it will look like, what kind of projects will be developed, um, but we're super excited. And so we encourage all of you to consider uh, applying for those. Essentially the funds are as a recognition of the time that you might be taking away from other kinds of research in order to be able to contribute some time to um, this kind of new thing that hasn't yet been uh, determined. But our goal is that we could also use that year to help people find um, potential um, grants to apply for in future years, um, think about places that they could publish their work, you know, um, kind of getting all this the, the groundwork in place so that after the first year is over, that group of people can move on and uh, move their research to whatever next stage is appropriate for the kind of project that they did. And so um, that, is the, that is the main fellowship program that we have so far um, that will be starting next year. Um, but we would love to see that grow and potentially other kinds of um, you know, fellowships down the road too. All righty. Well, I really appreciate all of our speakers presenting today and sharing their work with us. It's great to get to know you a little bit better. And, um, and thanks to everyone who was here in the audience to listen. And just a reminder that we'll have this recording up soon that you can share with your colleagues or um, if you wanna go back and, and watch the other sessions if you miss them. Um, again, this is the third of three that we did this semester and we're gonna continue this program in the, in the fall. So if anyone knows of folks that um, they would like to hear from who maybe came this year or next year um, and who wasn't part of the, the program, we're very happy to um, fold them into our plans for next year. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you have a good one and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much.